before Brother Jim comes, if you'll turn with me uh, for just a moment in the second chapter of Acts. This is the year 2010, and I don't know if the rest of you have got used to writing that, but I'm still old nine. And I put the O down, and then I try to sneak the one in front of it, because I'm not used to writing 10 yet. There are people that have already been thinking about uh, publishing magazines, probably a lot of magazines have already come out, about the new and improved things you need this summer. You need a new wardrobe, and you need a new... Uh, tools to work in your garden, and, and there's been publicity already started to try to gear you toward buying these things because they're new, and it's something, a change that you need uh, in some way to improve your life. So I'm going to go back to the day in, in time, and starting in the 38th verse of Acts in the second chapter, and I think today in the world that the religious world thinks that we need stuff that's new and improved too sometimes. And what I want to do is take you back to the time and how we began and what was stated there. In the 38th chapter it says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent ye and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now who's afar off? He's talking about to their children there, and he says to them that are far off. If we go to Ephesians 2 and 13, it says, But now is Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. So today, we are in that promise because of the blood of Christ. And, and we have a right to those things too. In verse 40 it says, And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this word generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And as I've read about this, there was already disciples following Christ, okay? There was already people that were observing the Word as they knew it at that time. But on this particular day, it says 3,000 more were added to that cause. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Just the same things that we do here on the first day of the week. They had fellowship with one another, they broke bread, and they had prayer for one another. And fear come upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and had all things in common. You know, at the beginning it was probably a lot more pure than it is today. Because they all had things in common. There wasn't divisions at that time in this part of the church, okay? Uh, there were other different religions, and we know that, and... Uh, I think Brother Dan preached a couple of Sundays here ago. They even had statues to the unknown God so that they would cover all their bases. Verse 45 said, And sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men and every, as every man had need. And they, continuing lately with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. What is that singleness of heart? And do we still have that today? That singleness was that they were serving an awesome God. And that if we, if we turn back over there, it said that they were gladly received his word. Today, some people, we try to beat it in them by giving them scripture after scripture after scripture, and they don't want to receive it. These people opened their hearts, and they gladly received the word. Breaking bread from house to house and to eat their meat with gladness and singles of heart. You know, Thursday nights is not a real popular place here at Glacier Creek. There's very few that come. But the other night, we, and we'll have it downstairs on the cold nights because it's easier to heat this one little room. And I'm trying to think if there was, there was less than 10 in that class one night down there. And I said, you know, this kind of reminds me of probably how church started out because people would meet in their houses and they wanted to talk to each other about the Word. And probably back then, everybody didn't have their own Bible. 
So they shared the word one for another. And, and, it's, and it's awesome to be down there and to get discuss this. It was like two or three families represented that night. But to think that's how this began. But just a few people meeting together and discussing God and how great he was to them. Verse 47 says, Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily as should be saved. We don't need a new and improved religion. We just need to go back and see how the one that we have started and follow in those steps. This time, Brother Jim, to bring the message. Thank you, Brother Tom. We want to turn the hymn to the number 640. That'll be our hymn of invitation. If you're not a Christian today, I want you to know that there's people here that love you that's concerned about your future. And we're going to do everything we can to share the love of God with you. That you may find it. Thank you, Brother Tim. Sue and I have been trying to get a card together to send to the church. And we're struggling to find words to tell you what you meant to us. I sometimes think where I would be had I not have chosen this path. What my life would be like, where I would be, what would be my condition. The Bible says there is a way that seemeth right to a man. But the writer said at the end thereof there's a way of death. I want you to do something this morning that's a little bit different than something we've done. If you have a Bible, open it to the 23rd Psalm. If you don't have a Bible, just repeat with us all together. And then I want to make some comments on that. The Psalm of David, given of God to show his confidence love for God. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff. They comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Out of all the scripture, that may have been used by more people and at different times than maybe any other scripture in the Bible. I know in the span of time that I've spent on this earth and, and been associated with this church, there have been times when I held the hand of someone I love and someone I've been with and say the Lord's Prayer together and you could feel the clasp of the hand slowly give way and they pass into the presence of God. There is nothing mysterious about our journey here on earth. There is nothing complicated about it. We make it mysterious and we make it complicated because we find ourselves struggling to come under the word of God and do what God says. He's a tough taskmaster, but he is also the great rewarder of them that diligently seek him. David wrote, the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. I have never wanted in my life for the basic necessities of life. The Lord has given me opportunity to provide that for myself and my family and, and the ability to help others. 
Had I not been following the Lord, I doubt very seriously that I would have cared much about the people as I do, or would have given to the people as I do. And so the Lord is our shepherd. If you're a Christian today, you are the household of God. You are a flock. You are an elect group of people. And we should be proud of that, that we found that. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. When that is said very softly, I, I, I go back and I, and I look at the scriptures. I'm, I'm amazed at what mankind expects of God. There was a man in the Bible that sought the voice of God. There was a great wind, but the voice of God was not in the wind. There was fire. But the voice of God was not in fire. And then the Bible said, a soft voice became the voice of God. In a few minutes, we're going to sing a song. And it just says softly and tenderly. One of the things that I love about this church and this place, and I love the plan of God, there's no pressure. There's no pressure. The responsibility is given out. You better take care of yourself because nobody else is going to do it for you. They can't do it for you. This is one journey we must take alone. And Job best may be touched upon it. When he said, naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. That's how we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Stripped of all of our earthly possessions, and the only thing that will follow us is the good things that we've done. The works of the Christian will follow in the presence of God. All of us need our souls restored every once in a while. God knew this, and he said, that's why you need to assemble yourselves. That's why you need to be together. There's going to be times when you need your family. And I thought the other night as we were down at the funeral <coughs> of all the people that came by, my, my. And then I've also been in, in funerals where there wasn't but four or five people. Some of them, there wasn't enough to even bear the casket to its final place. And I thought, my God, my God, to live this life and to never have done anything or been anything to someone or meant something to someone. I can't think of that. I can't understand it. How that we would live our life and never touch someone else for the good of God. It amazes me. But he takes us here. He restores our, our souls when it's down. And the waters are still. And there's no storm. The waters are still. And the waters are calm. God will always take us in the path of what's right. He'll never take us in the path of what's wrong. We must trust that. That God will always take us in the direction of something that's good for us or, or maybe for someone else. And then he says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I wonder why that death is talked about so much in the Bible, but yet we don't want to discuss that today. And if your parents raising young children, you need to talk with them. You need to explain it. It's a mystery to them. I never will forget that we were up in Ohio and Joni had little Eli with him, with her, and he's about four, I think. And as we walked across past the casket, and he asked his mommy, he said, "Mommy, what what happened to Uncle Leroy?" And she said, "Well, Eli, he died." And here was Eli's concept. Who shot him? 
<laughs> Parents of today, you need to take a little more time. The schools are not going to teach you about God. They're not going to teach you about eternal life. They're not going to teach you about fellowship with the Spirit of God. They're not going to teach those things. They're going to teach in opposition. And you need at a very young age to sit down and say, Now look, this is what we believe. This is who we are. Don't ever forget it. So we all need that. But he said, I won't be afraid of evil. He said, For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. It is in our nature to shun bad things, and rightfully we should. But somewhere, sometime, there is a table set in the presence of people who don't like us, people who disagree with us. But as that table is spread, David said, God will anoint my head with oil. And he said, my cup will run over. This one year, if you can walk out of here this morning and with all of your heart say this, it would be such a great comfort to you. He said, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all of the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. If you will, let's stand together and turn to number 640. This could be someone's day. This may be the day that you say it's enough. I've had enough of this life. I, I look for something better. In the presence of people who love and care for you, we're going to ask you to come forward as we sing this song. So please.